Your Excellence, uh, Mr. Vice President, um, Honorable Ministers, um, ladies and gentlemen. It's actually very interesting to, to actually stand to look at you guys from this point. For those guys that are from South Africa, you would say this is a truly rainbow conference. Right? Um, now, for most of us, special uh, in Tanzania, this picture must truly uh, spark some memories. I remember going to school and uh, I was not exactly the fastest kid on the block. And you had to sprint to class in order to get a desk. So I had my share of sitting on the floor. After some time, I, I made up my mind that I'm going to sit on the floor, so I never used to run anyway. But it kind of made me angry, but in a good way. So I vowed that I'll not only sit at a desk in the future, but I'll help to improve somebody else's learning experience. Uh, for my high school, I went to a school where education was more than just books. For those of you that are from Zimbabwe, I'm an XPE boy. Yeah. Right. At PE, education was not just about books. Education meant improving that which comes naturally to the kid. If your issue is sport, then the school invested a lot of money to make sure that you are a good sportman. If you're a musician, they just did that. I didn't know that I could play wind instruments, but when I went to PE, they taught me how to play wind instruments. Now, if you're from, from parents like mine, this is what they told me when I was going to school. Go to school, work hard, and get good grades. There's only one problem with that. There are some students that are not good grade material. And it's not because they're dumb. It's because they're just not wired for class material. And I have a few friends that we thought they were stupid. But today, some of them are graduating from MIT, aerodynamics engineering. But in class, they were just, we call them, they're heavy and thick. As educators and parents, we have one duty, to figure out what these kids are good at and nature that. At university, it was a completely different game. It was not about who is the first and who is the last. At university, it was all about are we all understanding the concepts? Are we all in the same boat? The biggest issue at university was sharing knowledge. That was done in many different ways. One was discussions, group assignments. But at my university, University of Pretoria, it was very interesting. I, I didn't know what a forum was. But hey, I would have a problem with programming, and I'd put it on the university forum. There was a time I recorded uh, a time of exactly three minutes before somebody answered my problem. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. We also used and abused social networks. Now, it's so interesting that uh, every time I think of social network, the only thing that comes to my head is Facebook. A lot of people go to Facebook to upload pictures and, and see the prettiest girl in the world and all that. But for me, it's a place where I go to answer student questions. If you look at my blog um, uh, friends, I think a good 60% of them are students. So uh, for, for, for some of you that have just graduated or graduated in less than 10 years, you'd agree with me it's a natural process that when you graduate, you look for a job, right? Is that correct? And they make it so easy. You know, when you get from school, your parents will tell you it's easy. Just send your CVs to different companies. Oh boy, I did send some CV. I think I sent close to 100 CVs. And after two months, I figured out, you know what, when they want me, they'll come for me. I didn't send any more CVs. Luckily, 
Um, the founder of a uh, Tanzanian company called Zalongo Technologies was my first employer. And I remember telling my mother, I got a job, I got a job. And we knelt down and prayed about it. I worked for that company for a few weeks. I moved to another company called Bomber Design. And the friends and, and, and relationships I made a lifetime. Soon I worked for a company called uh, Millicom. You all know it as Tigo for nine months. My job was purely technical, but my supervisor allowed me to tag along in non-technical stuff. Things like sales meeting, and I didn't know that I could actually speak and listen. At the beginning it was so boring though. You know, there's people that talk about figures and, but after some time it started becoming interesting. I was like, oh, so this is how you sell the same thing to two different clients at two different prices. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> I was like, that's, that's really good, you know. Soon after that, um, I worked for a company in Norway called Freecode International. And here is where truly my career was fashioned. It was shaped. I have a passion for programming. If there's something I love more than my wife, it is programming. Right. And I'm saying that just in case she's, she's going to watch this conference, <laughs> right? So at Freecode, they had one model. They would never ask you, do you know this thing? They would just give you the task. Figure it out. No. But then I started thinking, hmm, if this company is making this much money out of free software, I think if I go home and start my own, I will not make as much. But if I make just 10%, I'll be the happiest man in Tanzania. So I made up my mind, I'm going to go home. I'm going to start my own thing. Now, our surroundings, I really like this picture. Because that big animal, tough luck. These dogs are quite on its case. Now, our surroundings has a lot of influence on us. And I was telling somebody this morning that when you're from a, a well-off family, a well-off community, your influence is, is good. This is what most of your parents will tell you. They'll take you to good schools. They'll tell you pass. And um, if you don't get a job, come back home. We have a business you can run. But the situation for a poor kid is not exactly the same. The surrounding almost guarantees your failure in life. You don't get the same education that the, the rich kids get. But for me, it was a little bit different. My parents are extremely hard workers, and they exposed me to the best they could afford. And I'm grateful to them for that. For me, it's not what your surrounding has to offer. It's what you have to offer them. Do not be content with being labeled a disadvantaged community. Take advantage of the disadvantaged community. I know that does not make sense, but hang on with me. My parents taught me a lot of things, a lot of things. But it's not what my parents taught me that I am today, shaped me who I am today. I lived in the village in Dodoma, right in the village. And the lesson I learned from that is that how you relate to people matters the most. I then lived in Dar es Salaam for a while. And in Dar es Salaam, it's all about hard working. Boy, in this city, if you sleep around, you, you die hungry. Living in other countries, I learned to swallow my pride and ask when you do not know. That was the biggest lesson. I remember going to South Africa the first time, and I spoke to somebody, and this guy could only speak Afrikaans. I was like, OK. I speak to him, I say, I don't speak English. The guy still spoke to me in Afrikaans. I went to Europe, and uh, that was a completely new world for me. So pretty much at every point, I kept on asking, so what exactly is the subway again? 
They'll tell me, oh, you can't get in without a ticket. Go and get a ticket first. So everything was new. But I learned to swallow my pride and ask. The one thing that the, our surrounding, especially in Africa, it never teaches us is the art of risk taking and risk management. The university does not teach us to employ ourselves. They teach us graduate, get employed. But it was time for me to be my own boss. And the first time we went to the office, it was pretty much like that. There was nothing in the office. Now you can imagine, when I made this decision, I just got married, and we just learned my wife is pregnant. And here I am, I want to quit the company I was working for. And the company in Norway was paying me really good. But I told myself, look, it's either you do it now, or don't do it at all. Now, as you know, family members in these issues, that's where you start seeing two groups. There was one group that said, no, 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 it's too risky, you can't do this. There was another group that said, yay, go for it. So there was a lot of variables that I needed to, to, to consider. Will this business pick up? Open source in Tanzania is not the most famous thing. And here I was wanting to start a business in open source. Do we have enough reserves to keep us going with the little baby growing in my wife's stomach? So the diet changed. We couldn't eat chips in my eye anymore. We had to actually, I had to actually go to the store and buy proper grocery every weekend. But I made that decision that I'm going to start my own company. Oh, I do not regret every moment of it. The first six months were pretty much broke. We spent all the reserves that we had. And then there was no customers. Very interesting. Couldn't go back to the company in Norway and tell them, please rehire me again. The most interesting lessons through it all is building the team. But that was also a challenge. You don't have a lot of open source developers in Tanzania. So the problem was not customers, the problem was employees. And here we were with my wife thinking, oh, okay, look, we have a bigger problem. The customers are coming, but we can't deliver. But that soon changed as we got employees that we had to train for almost four months before they could deliver anything useful. But we enjoyed every second of it. So we figured out at the office, like, OK, so we have a problem of coming up with employees. The best way to do this is to actually create the employees ourselves. So we said we need to get involved in the education. And most probably, that's why I'm here. We got involved in three different ways. The first one was to generate as much content as we can on programming. The usage of blog and social media and all that stuff. Right? We started carrying workshops and seminars at different universities. UDOM and IFM are pretty much our favorite. We've had lots of fun with students from there. Eventually, we figured out we might as well get involved in the education directly. So I requested uh, um, to start teaching at the Institute of Finance Management computer-related subjects. The whole point was not to teach them only what is on the syllabus, but to also teach them what is out of the syllabus. I remember the first time I got to class and I asked students uh, that were doing final year project, I asked them, do you know what is a repository? And these kids looked at me and said, no. I said, I think I'm at the right place. I went home and started preparing slides that same day. That same weekend, I was already conducting my first workshop at IFM. Then we figured out we need to do, we need to solve the problems. And here the biggest problem was actually the, the people to employ. 
So we said we'll create a project that we called uh, Talent Paradise. The idea behind this project is to say those that have been labeled, they've failed, grade seven, form four, form six, we'll take those ones, ask them, are you interested in computers? If the answer was yes, we'll teach them to be programmers. We just focus on programmers. Hopefully someday we'll do analysts and designers and graphics and all that stuff. So we got, our first uh, student was from uh, Arusha. We stayed with him for four months. And he's now back in Arusha. We gave him a laptop and a modem. And every time we have a job that we think he can handle, we send him, we send it to him. So we work with him on a freelancing model. This year we got two girls because at the company we only have one girl. So we figured out, let's add more girls. So we took one girl who is a Form 4 liver, who had never seen a computer, and we decided to push the boundaries. We got a house helper from a family near our office, and we are teaching them computers. Just last week they managed to open a Facebook account. I was like, I think we're getting somewhere. But that was not good enough. We quickly learned that um, in Tanzania we have so much resources, natural resources uh, especially. But the connection between the farmers and the consumers is not that well done. So that was the first project we wanted to do as a, as a company. And we said there will be so many projects, uh, problems to solve. So let's find a creative solution to solving them. We approach the students. Using our talk, we call it the art of innovation. The, the talk is, is geared to, towards encouraging students to solve our own problems. And uh, after doing three talks, we had six different groups that approached us with their ideas. And some of them are really business worth ideas. But we chose two out of the six because we do not have that many resources to support them. The first group is working on what they call the farmer's system. Uh, it's an SMS-based system that's going to connect the farmers and the consumers. Uh, our attempt is to try and make sure that when uh, people in the village take fruits to the market and they don't get buyers, what they usually do is they just throw them away and they go home and then two days later they come with some more fruits. We're trying to say no. The buyers should know when the fruits are in season. The buyers, the farmers should communicate to the, to the buyers. Another problem that we are, we are solving is uh, creating a centralized blood donor database. Uh, the students, uh, they're, they're, they're saying that uh, the biggest problem they have now is there's these very interesting blood groups that you do not really find the people that easy. So they're saying they want to make it easy for the hospitals to be able to contact them or to locate these people. And we thought that's, that's a pretty interesting problem. So we are helping them to solve. Last thing sharing. So it all boils down to one thing. Do you have something to share that somebody else needs? Right? Do you? For some of you that are soccer fans, you would agree with me that if you watch a Manchester and Arsenal game in your own bedroom, it's not as fun. But watch it with the guys on the other side. It's really fun. Especially if you have one guy that does not know soccer and he's the most talkative one. <laughs> so, do you have something to share? Do you have some knowledge? Do you have some skill? It makes more sense to share it. Now sharing might, might be something that we're not really used to. This last weekend I had a very interesting quote and I thought if I don't share it with you, I'll not do you guys justice. It goes like this. The uneducated of the 21st century are not those that cannot read and write. Are we together there? The uneducated of this century are not those that cannot read and write, but those that cannot unlearn their old lessons and relearn the new ones to adapt to this age. Are we together there? So you and I have to learn to share. It could be a book, it could be a program, 
I'm an open source fan, so if you're from a proprietary company, I'm very sorry. If it's a program, share it. Right? If it's a book, share it. If it's a, an information, anything you need, you think somebody else will benefit, please share it. It's only in sharing that will create a better Tanzania, a better Africa, and a better world for you and I. Thank you so much.